Here's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to talk about living in God's design for us out of Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. And in particular, God's design for marriage. It's going to be the illustration we use. Here's what I've discovered. Like sugar, the distorted marriage relationship is everywhere. It's all around us. And the very relationship that our creator and our heavenly father meant for us to be good and healthy and awesome and full of life when we do it his way is now changed. It's different. And you and I have to look at God's word and say, am I going to choose to to live that way? That might mean I have to give up sugar. Might mean I have to do something and live a totally different way than the rest of the world is living. But isn't that how God calls us to be? Because he wants what's best for us. He challenges us and he tells us and he gives us directions for every area of our life in the hope that you and I will live out his plan and his design for our lives because he knows what's best for us because he created us and he made us and he wants what's best for us. This morning, we're going to look at some things like that. There's going to be some challenging things as we look at these quintessential verses in marriage in the New Testament. It's probably the most holistic and graphic and descriptive section of verses in the New Testament that you and I have about relationships and about marriage. But I think that it's more than just a conversation about marriage. It's a conversation about how God made you as a man and how he made you as a woman. See, God created you a certain way and he made you that way on purpose. And men and women are different. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I figured that out last week. (laughs) I'm really different than Kate and Kate is really different than me. That's kind of what attracts us to each other, but it's true, men and women are different. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? It's how it works. And I do feel like sometimes I'm married to an alien. (laughs) And she feels that way every day. (laughs) But here's what's true. God meant for us to be together. God meant for you to be with your spouse together. And if you're single this morning, I recognize that, oh, here we go, another message in church about married people. I want you to know that being married is not God's perfect design for everyone, okay? Okay. If you're single and you continue to be single, then guess what? According to Ephesians 7, we're not going to look at that verse, but we'll look at some other verses there. Paul says he wishes we were all single. That we all would just dedicate our entire life to the gospel of Jesus Christ and be single. So I want you to hear this this morning. If you're single and and you're here, uh, please please don't turn your heart and your mind off this morning. Because what I want you to hear is that God made you a certain way as a man and as a woman. He designed you a specific way, and he desires for you to live out that design. Now, it is true that we're going to look at that in the context of a marriage relationship this morning because, frankly, those are the verses that we're studying in Ephesians 5 this morning as we've been working our way through. But would you hear, if you're single this morning, that God also has a special design for your life? Whether that's to be married down the road and you'll learn a whole bunch of stuff from that this morning or whether or not you're not supposed to and you're just going to live in God's design for you as a single person. Either way, God has a great design for your life as well. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. I'm going to read it from the New International Version. It says this, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, 
but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now let me read verse 33 again because it kind of summarizes the entire section. Paul says it really simply. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, as we dive into these verses, before we get started, I thought I'd share an extraordinary thing about this section of verses, something that I find extraordinary about what God has done. Do you ever think that, Lord, why did you do that that way? Why did you communicate it that way? Or why did you do that event that way? Here's what I find very interesting about this section uh, of, about marriage, and it's the best section we have in the whole New Testament. Why would God have a single person write this section? Exactly. Paul was single his entire life. There's no context of marriage. He doesn't understand anything about it. Yet he writes the greatest section about marriage here in Ephesians 5 and in 1 Corinthians 7. We'll look at that in a minute too. But here's a single guy telling us about marriage. Now here's why I find this significant. I find it significant because God is communicating to us something very important. And there's no agenda here. Follow me. If a married guy whose wife was not submitting to him wrote this section, what would we think? He wrote this section so his wife would start submitting to him. If a woman wrote it whose husband was not loving her, we would say what? She wrote this section just to get her husband to love her more. But we have neither. We have a single guy with no agenda, who's listening to God give direction to married people about how to live in God's design. Isn't that good? See, God always does things for our best interest and to get us in the right place. So this morning, I want you to know there's no agenda in this section, except that you and I would obey the Lord and would apply these things to our life. Now, let's begin with looking at God's design for men and women. In this section of verses, not only do we have some instructions about marriage, but we also see God's design for a man and God's design for a woman. In verse 33, it was laid out to us that what men will always want is to be respected. What women will always desire is to be loved. Now that's in you, whether you're married or not, that's in you because your creator put it in you. It's there because you are human, because you are male or female, and because God created men a certain way, and he created women a certain way. Men, this is why you and I are attracted to action and war movies, right? We're attracted to these things where men stand side by side and respect one another in strict military fashion and die for a respectful cause. And that's why we love things like that. Because of God's design for men to be respected, the best thing a woman can do is respect her husband and submit to his God-given responsibility and authority because he's the head of the relationship, just like Jesus is head of the church. Ladies, this is why you enjoy romance movies. It's why you want that knight in shining army to re armor to rescue you from your ordinary life into a life full of dancing and big poofy dresses and large castles and a lifetime of staring deep into one another's eyes in loving embrace. That's what you want. That's why you are fascinated with the bachelor and the bachelorette, even though you know the relationship won't last six months after the airing of this episode. You don't even care. You know it won't last, yet you're sucked into the love. And it's not even real love. It's all fake. Of course you'd fall in love in Fiji, duh. Jeez, you'd fall in love with a lizard there. Golly. Golly. 
the dumbest thing in the world. Sorry. I just hate that show. <laughs> it's just the opposite of everything in God's word. It's like, come on. Find somebody. Why are you an alcoholic looking in a bar? Come on. Sorry, I got off track. Now listen. Because God designed women to be loved, the best thing a husband can do is to love his wife. It's the best thing you can do is just love her like crazy, unconditionally, sacrificially. Be willing to do everything for her, even die for her like Jesus did for us. Now, this isn't easy, is it? These verses aren't easy. This isn't easy to figure out. But here's, here's what we can discover. There will be times, because it's not easy, that ladies, you will say what? My husband does not deserve my respect right now. There will be times that you will say that. You may say it out loud. You may see it in your mind, but I know you're saying it, right? How do I know you're saying it? Because there's times that I say, my wife doesn't deserve to be loved right now. I do the same thing. Men, we say that. Women, you say that. Here's the problem with that. If you and I only loved and respected each other when we deserved it, we'd have a big problem, wouldn't we? And if we only loved one another and only respected each other when we deserved it, then we wouldn't be like Jesus ever. Because that, because Jesus does the opposite. He loves us and he respects us when we've never deserved it. And so marriage becomes this great opportunity where you and I get to be like Jesus. We get to bring Jesus into our marriage and say, how can I learn to love someone that's not being so lovely right now? How can I learn to submit to somebody that's being a jerk right now? Well, Jesus is going to help me do that. I get to bring Jesus into my own life and into my marriage. Now, this is very important. It's extremely important because loving and respecting each other is God's design. When we love and respect each other, then we are bringing Jesus into our marriage. And we all know that we're not perfect. There's times where we're going to be rude, mean, disrespectful with our mouths. It's going to be times where we're sinful towards one another. And those are those opportunities in the relationship where we get to be like Jesus. Now, I'm not implying that we should continue to be that way and just continue to forgive and give grace. We should be growing and and extending love and grace, but we should always be getting better day in and day out as we learn to grow in Jesus and in this relationship. But I think what we all really want is a relationship that has enough love and respect in it and is strong enough and healthy enough and puts Jesus at the center of that relationship that no matter how we treat each other on the surface, we can bring Jesus into the middle of that, amen? And in that moment, you know, this person's not leaving me or going to continue to disrespect me because I was rude or try to get back at me or flank me from the other side. None of that's going to happen because they're going to be like Jesus to me because there's going to be times where I will need the same. And so there will be times where I will choose to love when my spouse is not love, loving me. There will be times that I'll choose to love when my spouse isn't being respectful. There'll be times where you'll choose to submit when your spouse is not loving you. That takes place because you're making Jesus the center of your relationship. Now, we do that to fulfill God's design in each other. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But the reason God asks us to follow his directions is so that we can enhance and fulfill the design that God has placed in us as men and women to be loved and to be respected. So once we understand God's design, that he's created men a certain way, he's created women a certain way, we can begin to understand why God gave the directions that he gave in Ephesians 5. So look with me at God's direction for men and women in marriage. Now it makes sense that God would say to men, love your wives. Why? Because it's a woman's deepest desire. It makes sense that God would say to women, submit and respect your husband. Why? Because that's his deepest desire. If we continue to do that for each other, what happens? 
we fulfill each other's deepest desires. And that's exactly why we probably got married in the first place. Because we wanted to be with someone that would love us and respect us and fulfill all of our desires for the rest of our life. Now, as we look at these directions, we will discover that they are challenging in one way or another. But many of God's rules and the things that he gives us in God's word are challenging. This is not the only exception to challenging things. Like, is everybody in the room loving your enemy right now? <laughs> like, that was one of Jesus' commandments, right? Love your enemy. Ooh, that's a tough one. That's kind of challenging. Does it matter if I'm married or not? Nope. <laughs> Love your enemy. How about yesterday? Did anybody pray without ceasing? Right? That's another tough one, right? So we have these challenging things in God's word, and we just learn to press into Jesus Christ and live them out. In this context, though, I think it's interesting. The verses that we're looking at today, in particular, have been very controversial and challenging in the church and very much so outside the church. Why are they attacked so often? Why are they challenged so often? Why do we often find ourselves trying to do the opposite instead of following God's plan for marriage in, this, in, in Ephesians 5? I think I've discovered why. Because the enemy of our soul knows that when you and I follow the commands of God, there is power. That when you and I obey God's word and live the way he's calling us to, there's great power in that lifestyle. And so when you and I choose to love and respect one another, there's great power in that. And so because the enemy of our soul knows that there's great power in the way that we should do life and do marriage together, he is trying as hard as he can to make sure that marriages in our culture and around the world don't do marriage like this. Because he knows if marriages if men love their wives and wives submit to their husbands, that marriage is probably going to last for 60, 70 years. But if I can get a woman to disrespect her husband all the time, and I can get a husband to treat her wife unloving, I'll give it five years. And we'll try that again, and the second one will last about five years, and then the third one will last about five years, and the fourth one will last about five years, and I just have two people with a lifetime of hurt and pain. And Jesus says, I've got something so much better for you. And I created it when I created man and woman in the garden. When I said, here's what women are always going to want. They're going to want to be loved. Here's what men are always going to want. They're going to want to be respected. And I want you to figure out how to do that in me. First, let's look at the direction for husbands because we want to follow these directions so that we can have healthy, powerful relationships with God and with each other. So first, God's direction is for the husband to be the head of the wife, like Jesus is the head of the church, and to also love his wife as Christ loves the church. Now, all of us understand really what this means, especially in the context of Jesus and the church. We, as Christians, we submit our responsibility to Jesus. He's the head of the church. He's the authority of the church. He leads the church. And so we, we understand that. But here's what else we understand about Jesus that's probably different than most of us as human men, right? Jesus leads perfectly all the time with grace and love and compassion and joy. And as men, we're called to be that way. But here's what we discover. It's easy to submit to Jesus, isn't it? Because you know he's good. You know he has his best interest, our best interest in mind. Even when we don't know what that best interest is, he has it in mind for us. And so he takes us the direction that he does because he wants the best for us. See, by God's direction, husbands are the head and authority in the marriage relationship. That means husbands were, were called to lead and to love like Jesus does. And we lead in love to fulfill our wives' deepest desire. But men, I'll say right now, it's difficult for our wives to submit to us as the authority when we don't lead like Jesus does. When we don't lead in love and in respect and in joy 
and having her best interest at heart, then she will be frustrated. And she won't want to submit to that authority because it's not loving. This is why God gave us the command as men to love our wives like Christ loves the church. Now, because God created women to be loved, it simply won't work for us as husbands to be insensitive or harsh with our words or angry or non-communicative or absent. When we don't love and lead like Jesus does, we, we leave a deep wound in our wives because they're longing by design to be loved. That's why God says, you must love well. To the wives, God gives this direction. By God's design, wives are to submit to their husbands. Now, we mentioned last week that there's mutual submission at times, like in verse 21, that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But then there are also specific times of submission that we see in God's word. This happens to be one where the Bible says wives should submit to their husbands. We have other specific verses. We'll look at one in 1 Corinthians 7. But another one would be like all of us are called to submit to the leaders above us in government, right? We're called to submit and pay our taxes. Gosh, I wish that wasn't in the Bible, but it is. We're called to submit in other specific ways. So we have moments of mutual submission and, and moments of individual submission. In this case, wives are called to submit to their husbands so that a man's deepest desire to be respected is fulfilled. See, submitting is how wives fulfill the husband's God-given design to be respected, just like the man is fulfilling your desire to be loved. Now, let me point out, this has got to be done together. It's got to be done together. Wives, if you're submitting wholly to your husband, praise the Lord, and if he's not loving you, that's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult and challenging and awkward, and your relationship will be somewhat unhealthy because there's one side that's not participating well. And husbands, if you have a wife that's not submitting to you while you're loving her, that will be equally awkward. So this has got to be done together. Husbands, we have to love, and wives, we have to submit. Now, because God created men to desire respect, the relationship doesn't work if wives are always trying to be in charge and take over his authority. If that happens, there'll always be a hole in his heart. He'll always feel frustrated. And he'll always long to live in his design to lead and to love like God calls him to, but he won't be able to if he's always being disrespected and never submitted to. See, we both end up with a hole in our heart if we don't follow God's word correctly. Now, does this mean that husbands don't need to submit to their wives and wives don't need to love their husbands? No, that'd be silly, wouldn't it? That'd be silly to think that. That's not what God's word is saying. We have texts all over the scripture that are communicating that we should love one another and that we should submit to one another. I'd like to take us to another section of scripture where we find this mutual submission and this specific submission and it's in the context of what we generally consider a, a challenging subject. So turn there with me to 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. And in this context, Paul talks about a, another way that we submit to one another specifically and mutually as ta Paul talks about sex and marriage. But it's interesting because he talks about the same concept of love and respect and submission in these verses. Look at it with me in verse two. He says, but since sexual immorality is occurring, just like today, sexual immorality is occurring, was in Paul's day. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Now, you, if we stop right there, you probably think, Pastor Mark, were, were there people having sex outside of their marriage in the church? Yep, that's why I had to give direction. Don't have sex with anyone else except for your spouse. That seems crazy that you would have to write that down. But there it is, right? It's because there was so much sexual immorality. Good thing that isn't happening today. 
Let's move on. Number three, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now here's what's interesting. Paul talks about love and respect and submission again. See, he says, first of all, because sexual immorality is kind of out of control, you, you need to save sex for in marriage. That's God's design. That's God's purpose. That's God's heart. But then it's interesting. He says, husbands, I want you to submit your bodies to your wife. In other words, here's an area you don't have authority because your body is not your own. It's your wife's. And wives, same way. So there's specific direction for submission and there's mutual submission because wives are called to do the same. Now, as Paul goes on, what's interesting that I find interesting about it is this goes right to the heart of love and respect. Let me show you how. If my wife came to me and said, honey, I want to have sex with you tonight. Would it be wrong of me to say, nah, nah, I'm feeling kind of selfish. I think the answer is going to be no. Will she feel loved in that moment? No. What if I go to my wife and I say, I'd like to have sex tonight. You look really pretty in that dress. And she says, nah, I don't feel like submitting to you that way tonight. How do I feel? I feel disrespected. And so in that moment, Paul says what? Do not deprive each other. Why? Because Paul is saying, don't not love each other. Don't not submit to one another. Don't deprive each other of one of the greatest gifts God has given you and the greatest way that you will discover your love and your submission for one another. So don't deprive each other of this because this is God's way of helping you come together and feel the love and respect in your relationship and to understand the design that God gave you, gave you because you will feel love and respected when you're done. And as well, you live in a culture that's sexually kind of out of control and you need to make sure that that's in marriage only. Now, as we continue that idea and that heart, that's not where our culture is. What we see happening in our world is is something interesting, and I've discovered this, and I've, you've probably seen this too. As Satan has distorted sex, he tries to do two things. One, before we're married, he tries to have, us, have as much sex as we can so that it's awkward in marriage. And after we get married, he tries to have, us have not as much sex as we can because he knows how powerful it is in marriage. Both ways, he's trying to distort it. That's why Paul gives this consent not to deprive each other. Why? Because Satan wants you to do the opposite. He wants you to deprive each other so that your marriage won't be strong. And Paul says, don't do that. Your marriage will be stronger as you have sex together because you will be loving and respecting one another. Now, here's what's interesting. In a world that's gone crazy with sex now, we're also no longer living in the design that God created us because we're no longer loving and respecting one another. See, when we have sex before marriage, we don't have to love and we don't have to respect. As a man, if a woman will just give herself to me the first time I've met her, and whenever I want it, she'll give it to me, I don't have to love her. I don't have to fully commit my life to her. I don't have to love every bit of her because I can just be selfish and want what I want. And if I'm giving it up to a woman and we're not married, then she doesn't have to respect me. She doesn't have to find the, my deepest need and fulfill it. And then we get married and it gets all messed up again. See, what God wants is two people to be attracted to each other. And for a young man and a young woman to say, oh, they're kind of cute. 
But before they get married, he begins to love her without sex. And he begins to love everything about her. And he begins to show her what it means to be loved without sex. To love every part of her. What she thinks, what she says, who she is as a person. And she begins to submit and to respect a man without sex. And show him that because of his love, she will submit to him all the days of her life. And then when they get married, they get this great gift that God has given us in marriage, sex. See, that's God's design. That's God's heart. That's God's plan. Now, if you haven't lived that way, that's okay. That's why there's grace and forgiveness, amen? That's why God can restore that in your marriage or even in your singleness. God can restore that as you commit your purity to Christ and wait for that next person. I want to encourage you to do that. So we can see in these section of verses that God gives us great direction and he gives us this direction so that we would fulfill the design that God has for each of us in marriage. Lastly, I'd like us to look at God's specific descriptions of submitting and loving. In verse 24, Paul said this. He said, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now the direction for wives is not as specific. And when we get to the husbands, there's actually some very specific things that we'll look at. But for the wives, he just, they, he just specifically says, submit to your husband the way that the church does to Jesus in everything. So it says that wives should submit the way that we do to Jesus. Now, how do we submit to Jesus? Well, we submit everything to Jesus. As a church, we submit everything to him. Our time, our resources, our mouths, our actions, our finances, our prayers, our heart, our decisions, even our sin, we submit it to Christ. And wives should submit to their husbands in the same way. Now, here's something I find interesting about submitting to Jesus. I've discovered that when I submit to Jesus, that doesn't mean that he controls me. Have you noticed that? Like, like he's longing for me to submit my life to him, but he doesn't want to control me like a puppet. He still gives me my own autonomy, my own ability to make choices and decisions. He's just hoping that I will bring him into every decision, into everything in my life. And when I do... He helps me and molds me and shapes me. And I think it's important for us as husbands to remember how Jesus leads us. That when our wives submit to us in a godly way and to the authority, that, that doesn't mean that we become a control freak. That, that doesn't mean that we no longer give our wives their own life or their own decision and that they become our puppet. That's not the point at all. We're to love like Jesus loves. We're to lead like Jesus does. And when we submit to Christ, we're still our own person. We still have our own thoughts and feelings and ideas. And we make our own decisions, but we need to bring Jesus into them. And that's what wives do with their husbands. The specific direction that we see for men is in verse 25 to 30. And I, I saw three things here specifically that I just want to point out as we close. The first one is that men are called to love their wives sacrificially. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then this last phrase, and gave himself up for her. See, loving sacrificially means you'll give yourself up for that person. It means you'll do anything for that person. Say, Pastor Mark, I would die for my wife. Good. But will you put the toilet seat down for her? I'm just saying, will you pick up your underwear for her? Will you wash your car? Will you take it to the mechanic? Will you mow the lawn? Will you do the dishes on occasion? Will you cook dinner? Barbecue if you do, it's way better. Right? So, I mean, here we see it, right? Love sacrificially means you're willing to give up your life. It means you're willing to, to submit to your wife in areas. And you're loving her 
and you're submitting your own interests for the benefit of hers, just like D Jesus did for us. Amen? That's what it means to love sacrificially. Second, lead her spiritually. Verse 26 and 27 says this, make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. Another way that we love our wives is to lead them spiritually. It's our responsibility to help our wives walk in holiness. We're to lead them in God's word and to make them holy. That means if they're struggling with something, find a verse in God's word that will help them walk through that. Grab her hand and pray. Do things that lead your wife spiritually so that she will know that you care about her and that you love her deeply and that you are committed to her and to her life and to what she's going through. But lead her spiritually. Last, care for her physically. The last part talks about a husband loving his wife like his own body. Earlier it said that the husband is the head of the wife. In other words, it's kind of like your brain is in your head and hopefully you're using it. But the brain does everything for the body, doesn't it? The brain tells the heart when to beat, tells the organs how to work. The brain helps your eyes see what they see, your ears hear what they hear, your feet go where they go. Your brain helps everything in your body function and work. And the husband is called to be that for his wife. He's called to care for her physically like the brain cares for the body. Husbands are called to care for their wives. It's our responsibility to care for their physical needs. So these are the specific descriptions for submitting and loving each other. So this morning, the challenge that you and I have from Ephesians 5 is to live in God's design. Live in God's design. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. We're called to live in God's direction and to take these two things, love and respect, and make them a part of our relationships because God's heart is for us to live in his design because it's God's heart for us to live a powerful, strong, full, whole, healthy life and have that in marriage. See, God's promise is that when we live in his design, our deepest desires are met. Not just one of them, all of them. Say, so God knows that? Yes, he does. He knows all of your desires and everything that the way that he created you because he molded you and he shaped you in your mother's womb. He knows everything about you. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what you like and what you dislike. He knows what's best for you every second of your life. And these verses ask us to simply submit our lives to God's design, to his heart for us, whether we're single or married. Now, lastly, let me close with this. There's an even higher purpose for us to fulfill these verses in marriage. Because when we have a healthy marriage, we get to honor Jesus. Let me explain. All of you have a workplace. And hopefully you are men, hopefully you're loving your wives at work just as much as you do at home. And so I'm hoping you might get some scenarios like this. Man, I hear you talk about how much you love your wife all the time. Did you notice, like I did in that video that Bobby had, did you notice his face light up when he talked about Dory? Wasn't that great? He got a smile on his face, a little twinkle in his eye. And I'm guessing when he's at work and he's hanging out in the break room with some other men, that when he talks about Dory, that same smile and that same twinkle comes. And those men probably hear you hopefully love your wife in that context. But those men in that room are probably thinking, is she really that great? <laughs> I mean, is she really that great? Because my wife is rude to me sometimes and she's mean and she's ornery and sometimes she's unsubmissive. Is she really that great? And 
probably one of them at some point will ask, is your wife like really Wonder Woman? And you might say, no, not all the time. And here it comes. But Jesus gives me the strength to love her all the time. Would you like to go to lunch tomorrow? I'd love to tell you about Jesus. What he can do for you and what he's doing for me. Now my marriage just led someone to Jesus. And wives, when other ladies never hear you gossip or talk bad about your husband, and they're like, hey, how come, how come you never talk about your husband in a bad light? Like, is he perfect? Is he Superman? And the answer is what? No, not at all. Well, how come you never talk bad about him? Well, because I'm learning to live the way Jesus wants me to. I'd love to talk to you about that at lunch tomorrow. Would you like to go? And now your marriage just led someone to Jesus. See, that's God's design. That's God's heart. That every area of our life, as we live in God's direction and God's purpose, that we would lead other people to Jesus. So I want to encourage you this morning. Wherever your marriage is at, maybe your marriage is in a great place, awesome. Maybe your marriage is struggling right now. I want to encourage you to begin to live out the design that God has given us in his word. I promise as you follow his design and his directions, there will be health and wholeness and power in your relationship. And if you're struggling with how to do that day to day, would you just connect with one of us as a staff this morning? We'd love to pray with you. And then we'd also like to maybe give you some resources that would help you further enhance your marriage the way that God calls you to. Amen. Well, could you stand with me this morning? I'd like to close with just um, a prayer for our marriages. And so if you're married in the room, I'm going to ask you to grab your wife's hand. And since... Since mine's in the room now, could I ask you to come up so I can hold your hand? If you're single, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you don't feel called to be celibate the rest of your life, and you're single, just hold your hand right here. This is your future spouse. This is him or her. This is the design that God has for you in your future. And you can begin to prepare yourself now for what God has for you. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks this morning that you do great things in us. We thank you that you made us. You made man. You made woman in your image. You designed us to be loved and respected. You put that in us so that our relationships could be whole and healthy. And this morning, Lord, we hold the hand of someone right in our life right now or we hold the hand of someone in the future. And we ask that you would help this relationship to be healthy. Jesus, we invite you into our marriages. We invite you into our homes. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our hearts and into our minds and Help us to live for Jesus. Help us to love our wives. Help, help wives to submit to their husbands. Help us not to deprive each other of anything so that you can be exalted and praised and glorified. And Lord, so that we could have healthy marriages that we love and are excited about. Lord, that's your plan. And it's what we want to live in. Would you help us do it? Lastly, Lord, if there are some in here that are struggling in marriage right now, I pray that you would help them to begin to find comfort and forgiveness and the joy that is coming and the hope that is coming as they begin to live in God's design. Would you help them to live out these things in God's word? Would you help their marriage to begin to become strong and whole? In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all said...
thanks for being here this morning. It was great to see all of you. Remember, you can sign up in the comments for Rooted and for our 40-day prayer challenge coming up. Always remember, Jesus loves you very much. So do Kate and I.